a huge round of applause, please, for Juliet Haugen. Good morning, and thanks for having me here today. Uh, I'm definitely part of the beyond of this conference, Cloud Computing and Beyond. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a project that I've been having a lot of fun with at Cloudera, uh, which is measuring our own software quality. So, who am I? I'm the head of data science for engineering at Cloudera, and why am I here? Well, it's sort of twofold. I love talking about math and the history of math and programming and really just sharing things that I find really interesting because the research that I get to do for it ends up being exciting. <laughs> and I was kind of goaded into it because I was having a conversation with a person who is interested in data analytics and they said, the only way you can know anything is through experiments. Experimentation is the only way. And that made me kind of mad because I think that without experiments there are ways that we can come to conclusions and so I wanted to share some of the methods that exist as well as some of the challenges for not being able to use experimentation when you're trying to come to conclusions about something. And the way that I'm going to do that is by giving a specific example and working you through the problem that I was trying to solve, which is what is the software quality of the product that we build and to ship out across releases, so comparable software quality across releases. So everybody loves A-B testing. When if you go to see one of these big internet companies, data scientists talk, I swear 50% of them will be talking about experimentation and A-B testing. And so this is a beautiful thing if you can have it. You know, if, you're, if you, for example, work for a consumer-facing company and you are testing small things that have potentially useful but limited impact on the user experience, then it's easy to have a few different options that you put in front of people. So a good example of one of the prototypical A-B testing experiments people run is what, what color button increases ad revenues. So Google's design team is sort of notorious for this, where they have two different, slightly different shades of blue, and they try to determine which one has, has a large effect on the ad revenues that they get. And so the reason that experimentation is really useful for these sort of business questions is that you want to know a causal effect. And experimentation is something that helps us eliminate some of our input bias and how we're assigning uh, treatments, so like blue button or a slightly different color blue button, and sort of smooths over the, that error coming in so that we can get to stronger conclusions. And so you want strong conclusions because you want to make more money. And that's what it comes down to for businesses. Luckily, with, ex with experimentation and causal questions, we've been trying to address this in many ways for a long time. So examples of causal questions that we've asked are, does smoking cause lung cancer? Do zinc supplements increase or decrease the length of a cold? And does you know, moving um, a button around or changing its shade increase or decrease ad revenues that you're getting? So let's talk about some ways in which we sometimes are not actually able to run experiments and get that gold standard of causal inference and experimentation. So one is situations where it's impractical to run an experiment. This is the situation business-wise I ran into, where the, the thing that I wanted to measure, the thing that I wanted to test, it's impractical to do. Um, we make software, we have different versions of CDH, and customers which are other large companies, and I'll describe what their software does later, but other large companies will choose which version they're going to use and then they'll run it. I can't go to a large bank and tell them, you're going to run the latest version. This is like the dream of anyone that works in enterprise software, just tell people to upgrade and they upgrade. If you're working in a continuous deployment environment in the cloud, this is something that's a bit more practical. Sometimes you can choose to make changes that are beneficial to the user or to make random changes and sort of give half of your population a red button and half of your population a blue button and see what the difference is. But if it's something that really fundamentally impacts their user experience or they're coming to your site for one specific reason and you take away that reason, it might not be something you're able to do. So impracticality is a really legitimate issue uh, when it comes to being able to either run experiments or having to rely on observational methods. The second way in which you're often limited from running experiments is if it's completely unethical. So, does smoking cause lung cancer? Okay, so 
this half of the room, I'm gonna make smoke a pack a day for the next 20 years. And this half of the room doesn't have to. And then what I'll do is determine the outcomes, differences between this half of the room and this half of the room. It doesn't seem particularly ethical given the information that we have. And yet we still know, or at least believe given the sort of broad reach of the scientific evidence that we have, that smoking does cause lung cancer. And so epidemiologists have ways to deal with this problem of trying to get causal inference when you are limited from doing experiments and you can't actually force people into the different treatment groups or exposure groups. So what are, what are those methods? You know, if we can't experiment, how do we really know anything? And this gets down to sort of a philosophical, epistemological point which honestly a lot of statistics does, and that's something that I find very fascinating, is how you make a good argument using mathematical models, which you're trying to argue apply to the real world. Uh, this is not what I'm here to talk about today, so how about I rephrase the question? <laughs> it is something a lot more approachable, it's something that I enjoy, which is, how can we do math and program for fun and profit without running experiments? So, how do I do some interesting data science that's useful and creates business value, uh, without actually being able to do A-B testing. So, to get concrete, I'm going to tell you about the problem that I was working on. So I work at a company called Cloudera. Cloudera builds an enterprise distribution of Hadoop and some proprietary software for managing Hadoop clusters on top of that. Hadoop consists of a bunch of different software components that are open source, and so for a given version of CDH, our product, which is data management software, we have a version of Zookeeper, and a version of Pig, and a version of Kafka, and a version of MapReduce, a version of Spark, a version of HBase, of Impala, that all sort of fit together. We test really well, and then we sell that along with proprietary software on top of that to our customers, and we also provide support. And so the support part is actually really interesting to me, because we have customers out there which are large organizations and tons of users in them, and those users call us if something's wrong. And they tell us, I was trying to do this thing, here are my log files, this is the error that I ran into, what happened? And so I'm getting feedback from our customers about what is what they're experiencing, and particularly the negative events that they're experiencing. And so about six months ago, I changed jobs. I used to do a lot of uh, sort of like machine learning consulting for our customers, where I would go, they would, I would go to a huge telecom in Indonesia, and they would say, I need to do churn prediction on our customer base, the data set's too huge, how do we use Spark to do this? And I'd implement that. I then changed teams when this guy started working at Cloudera. So he is the VP of engineering, his name's Dan Sturman, and he comes in and he's like, okay, I have a simple question, but I don't think anyone has an answer. And that is, is our software any good? Is it getting better? Is it staying the same or is it worse? Legitimately a good question and Honestly, off the bat, a really hard one to answer. And so, as a mathematician, I try to take really poorly formed problems and translate that into something that's actually answerable. And so, this means phrasing a really specific question. And so the method that I use, and this is probably one of the most useful slides that I have, and I'm gonna warn you right now that I'm not putting these slides online because I have data results which are fine for me to share here, but I'd rather not put them online publicly. Um, and I've erased the axes of any uh, particularly interesting data, <laughs> which you'll see later. But when I hear the question, is the quality of CDH, our software, improving? Okay, well, let me phrase this into something more concrete. What is the unit of observation? What is the thing that I'm studying? So in smoking trials, you're studying people, and those people are either smoking or not smoking. And the exposure there is smoking or not smoking. In our case, is the quality of CDH improving? We have discrete releases, and so the exposure is what release a cluster is running. So customers can have multiple clusters, and I decided the cluster is probably the most specific way to look at this. And then you usually need some sort of comparison group. So does smoking cause lung cancer? Well, what is the comparison group? Is it a group of people that do not smoke? Perhaps, yes. And that is a baseline that you're gonna compare some sort of out, like the two outcomes between groups in between. And then what is the outcome you're looking for? Lung cancer or not lung cancer? In our case, I actually sort of got a head start on determining what sort of nouns attached to the questions here, because 
people had already started looking at this. So I started working on this project and I've shown these graphs. And this is cumulative counts of things. And so the different colors on these graphs correspond to different versions. And the one on the top right you can see is cumulative counts of clusters running a version of CDH. And on the bottom, we have cases and escalations. These are support cases. So cases are when a customer calls us up and they say, hey, I have a problem, and it goes to our support team. If our support team can't handle it, and it's a very challenging problem, those then get escalated into engineering. And that is very time intensive for engineering. So of course, the VP of engineering is particularly concerned about those. As we can see for this orange and green versions, that the cases and escalations are going up very high and quickly but so are the number of clusters running them. So how do we make a good comparison? The answer to a lot of questions in comparisons and trying to understand differences between groups usually means normalizing or dividing by something. But it's really actually relatively unclear what you should be dividing at any point in time to result in something that isn't very noisy. But seeing this, I realized that, okay, I at least have some of the nouns to associate with these questions back here. And so I rephrase the problem. Does a release of CDH affect the rate of support tickets or escalations that are coming in on a cluster as compared to some sort of baseline release? So I looked at the most recent line of releases that we have, CDH5, and I said our baseline release is the, is the most recent one, CDH5.0. How do, how do the rates compare? How do these rates compare over time? So, one of the way, reasons that I knew that I could rephrase the problem this way is that this is a problem that's already solved. I love solving problems that are already solved. They're the easiest problems to solve. <laughs> and so, there are two sort of types of techniques that fall into this category of comparing rates. If you're looking for a time to an event, this is often called survival analysis because traditionally this is used by actuaries doing life insurance or um, epidemiologists that are looking for diseases that might take you out of the population of observation were you to get them, or seeing if, like, if you get lung cancer, how long it takes you to remove yourself from the population of observation, which is the delicate way I'll put that. <laughs> so survival analysis is a way to study the time to a single first event. If you then want to actually study multiple events, so for example, in a CDH cluster, if we get a support case, it doesn't mean that that cluster is, is going to not get another support case in the future. That cluster doesn't go offline forever. It just continues to run and we might get more issues on it. So we're looking for multiple events and overall rates. So it's a time to then figure out, okay, this problem solved. How did smarter people than me solve this before? How have people done this in the past? <laughs> and it's actually really fascinating that uh, uh, this has been done a lot in the past. People have been looking at aggregate risk and aggregate rates as a way to come to like good business decisions for a long time. Um, the earliest version of, so I looked into maritime cargo insurance and sort of looked historically how far back can we go to still find instances of maritime cargo insurance and interest rates being set for maritime cargo insurance. And Hammurabi's code is probably the first place that I found. You go to Greece, and Greece became actually very concerned, and the different city-states have various interest rates that are published through either different authors or orators speaking about what their interest rates should be. So Demosthenes spoke a lot about this, particularly about the interest rates in roads. The Merchants of Venice, <laughs> just a lovely play. I always try to reference a little Shakespeare wherever I go. And of course, Lloyd's of London, which is an organization that still exists today, where people have been getting together for a long time and looking at these aggregate rates at, and trying to determine how to use that to make good business decisions and make money off of it. So, going back to trying to actually solve my specific problem and looking for inspiration to these actuaries and people trying to set insurance rates is, well, how long does it take for us to get somewhere? So, the trick, like I said, is this normalization procedure. We want to normalize or divide by something so we can make comparable, uh, make reasonable comparisons. And what we end up doing is looking at times to events. So a customer's or a cluster has a new version installed on it, CDH 5.1. Five days later, we get a support ticket. So there's five days for our first event. 
We're gonna reset the clock, and then since that event, how, how much time did it take to get to another event? And this is actually exactly what uh, sort of originated in the Lloyds of London era, when people were trying to determine, basically, well, yeah, trying to determine how long it takes for ships to either get attacked by pirates, which seemed to be a huge concern back in the day, and is less of a concern in most regions of the world now, and whether or not they'll crash and lose cargo. And so we measure the time to events, and we can make these plots that compare time to events between two groups. So in order to understand this one, I think it's a little easier to think about in terms of having just one event. But on the right is the survival curve where you say, okay, this is the time to event for a huge population, and we start with 100% of the population not having had an event yet. And then as time goes on on the right, we can see that people get more and more events, and the percentage of the population that have not yet had an event goes down. So this is basically what this graph is saying. What percentage of the population has not yet had an event? And so if it's really close, if it's a really sharp curve and close to the y-axis, then that is having more events quickly. And so that blue group seems to be in a worse off position, or at least events happening more quickly than that red group. And so this curve is called a survival curve, or if you're doing this with multiple events and treating them all as the same, as you're putting them all in the same curve, it's called a hazard curve. And so this is really the comparable uh, the comparable unit that we want to be able to make comparisons between. And so we have a 5.0 curve, and then we make comparisons between the other ones. So in, I, I then come up with some hazard model. This hazard model basically says, okay, the hazard rate, so the rate of events at a given time, is equal to some baseline rate times something that captures uh, features of a cluster. And so the feature of a cluster I'm most interested in is the version that it's running currently, that is not the baseline version. And so there'll be some sort of multiplic multiplicative effect on the overall rate, depending on the version. And so if that multiplicative effect is greater than one, then there's more support events. And if it's less than one, then there's less support events. So when I make these plots, if I see that my uh, estimate is less than one, then that is better. And if it's more than one, it's greater. And so, I've told you the easy part, which is, okay, I found a solution, I'm gonna mechanically work on it. The hard part is that statistics is really easy to lie with, especially to yourself. And so the next section of this talk is talking about like, okay, great, we figured out how epidemiologists and actuaries can solve this sort of problem, it's kind of mechanical. How do we then not lie to ourselves and become charlatans? So, the first thing you should do is file your protocol. And this is something that people that are doing drug studies, and this is taken from experimentation, which is what is it that you're gonna do? Do not decide what you're gonna do, try to do it, see that it doesn't kind of work, go back and try to tweak it later. Um, agile experimentation is actually a really bad way to do any kind of experiment because you're changing your protocol along the way. And so you document your plan. And this is actually also really useful when you're working with a bunch of executives who have spent a lot of time arguing over graphs and what they mean. You come to them and you say, okay, I have a plan. This is my plan. Please comment on my plan. Tell me what you think about my plan. And once we all agree to it, this is the plan I'm going to stick to when I do my analysis. So PhD economics, which is pretty hilarious, um, has an explanation of the scientific method, where there's this pure idea of what the scientific method is, and then there's, there's this significantly more corrupt version of the scientific method, which actually gets practiced, which means kind of always modifying what you're trying to do to get the results that you need and you want. And so this is what we're gonna to try to avoid, and everything else we're gonna bring up in how to make observation go really well is gonna be in supporting doing the top one and not the bottom one. Another example of a terrifying thing that happens in observational studies that will lead you down the wrong path is a thing called Simpson's Paradox. So Simpson's Paradox happened in the 70s in UC Berkeley. And UC Berkeley's administrators were looking at their admission statistics, and they saw that they admitted 45% of the men that applied and about 35% of the women. They were like, oh, what has happened here? We must have done something very wrong. And so they got a committee, and the committee went and looked at the data and tried to understand what happened. And it turns out that when you look at the percentage of admissions by department, the results actually switch. Where you look at the English department, and they've admitted more women than men. And so this is a very normal thing that happens 
when you look at effects that are aggregated over groups and then you try to split it over natural groupings, is that you can have one effect in the overall group and then a different effect in natural groupings. And so the conclusion that this, uh, this team that was assigned by UC Berkeley to look into this came to was that the, the proportion of genders that are applying to, say, English departments, which are extremely competitive and take a smaller percentage of applicants, uh, the, basically women tend to apply to departments that are much more competitive, take a smaller percentage of applicants, and have a smaller number of slots than men do. So engineering schools, math schools, tend to have much higher acceptance rates than English departments, social, social sciences, things like that. And so the relative populations of, and sizes of these populations can sort of wash out when you look at the aggregates. And so constantly slicing your data on natural groupings and reanalyzing re your assumptions ends up being very, very important in observational studies. So along the same lines, confounding is a variable. So who knows, or <laughs> confounding is inevitable. Um, who knows what confounding is in the context of analysis? Oh good, confounding is really cool. So it was once, a study once showed that ice cream caused polio. Mm. <laughs> Who here believes that ice cream causes polio? No way. Right? So polio symptoms are exacerbated in the heat, and people eat more ice cream when it's hot. Oh, yeah. So if you only look at one variable, and you exclude another, you could be looking at the wrong thing. Uh, and that's, that's the essence of it. So trying to cover as many variables as you think are legitimately related to your problem in, in the way you approach your problem ends up being very important. So this is where filing your protocol and getting it reviewed ahead of time, so like writing down your plan, sharing it with people and getting their feedback ends up being very important. So you can say, this is my plan, here are the variables I'm gonna use. What else am I missing? What else should be here? You're like, you expert in this field, what should be here? And people will comment on that, and you can add that into your analysis and make sure that you're not forgetting uh, summertime as a feature, not just ice cream. Handling unusual data. Um, I work with data a lot and it is awful. Data is just always terrible. There's something always wrong with it, there's something wrong in the formats, you have some weird parsing errors, it's always gonna happen. So, plan for it. And this is again, needs to be part of the plan that you publish in your protocol, which is how are you gonna handle bad data, how are you going to handle outliers, and how are you going to handle missing data? Because you're going to have almost all of these. Um, this graph is an example of uh, data from the future happening in my, in my results, where for different versions I saw basically event times that were longer than the, that version of software had been out. And so this is a great graph to look at and just sort of double check that you're doing something remotely sane, because I see this and it's like, this isn't very sane. So plan for what you're gonna do with bad data and put that in your protocol slash your plan. And this is a moment where I'm gonna pick on some physicists because it's probably one of my favorite hobbies. I uh, studied math and physics in college and I really very much enjoyed physicists and physics in general, but physics really gets to the point of the difference between the model that you build and reality. So we would like to think that physics is studying the math that reflects the nature of the world, but we still need to make an argument that what we're, what we're studying, the experiments that we're running actually relate to the world. So Robert Millikan is an excellent example of someone who did not say what he was gonna do with his outliers, and thus now draws quite a bit of flack from me, but also a lot of people for not doing the correct experimental method, which is filing your protocol and saying what you're gonna do with your outlier. So Robert Millikan was studying the charge to mass ratio of the electron. And so the way he's done this is he got this little, there's a little apparatus on the left there, there's a little spritzer with oil in it, and then there's an induced magnetic field that the drops of oil fall down in and then you can change the direction. And so if your drop of oil has different numbers of electrons on it, they always have integer different numbers of electrons, you can measure how long it takes for the drops of oil to go to from one, one distance, like one side to another, and you know the distance. And so from that, you can deduce what the charge to mass ratio of the electron is. 
Has anyone ever done this experiment? It's terrible, right? Like, you, you sit in a dark room, you sit there measuring the time, it takes hours, it's awful. It's just, I can see how this happens. So what he does is he runs this experiment, he writes it all down in his lab notebook, he publishes a paper that's one of the most, uh, it has the smallest error bars for it's his time. And later on, people went back to his lab notebooks and they saw that he had actually not used all of the data that he collected when he wrote his paper and did his data analysis. He removed outliers from his data. Mm. And the really, really interesting thing is that if he had not removed those outliers, his error bars would have included the correct charge to mass ratio of the electron, but he removed them so he could have narrower ones. So, have a plan for what you're gonna do with outliers, how you're gonna identify them, and why you would remove them or not, and probably don't remove them. So, Isaac Newton, it take, I, it, it's hard for me to pick on Isaac Newton because I have such a great amount of awe for the work that he's done, but it's also a kind of amazing example of how our, your heroes can also make mistakes. So, in Principia, Isaac Newton calculated the speed of sound in air. And his calculation was correct until he added the correction terms to make his calculation match the well-known speed of sound experimentally collected at that date. So he knew what the answer should be. He wrote down what the answer was, and then he started to make it match what the answer should be. Right, but everyone already accepted and knew the answer was. And these corrections kind of come out of nowhere, they're not particularly well justified, and they make his calculation match exactly the experimental results of the day. So this isn't it, this is a the beginning example, or like probably the earliest example I could find of bad bandwagon bias, where everyone agrees on something, you're gonna try and find the results and make your analysis fit what you think the results should be. So, this is just one guy. And it's easy to fool yourself. I understand, I'm sure Newton, like, Newton did a lot of other really incredible, amazing things in Principia, and the fact that he got most of the way there and added some corrections, okay. Um, we get to Feynman, who is also an incredible, respected hero of mine. And he has this great quote that says, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and that you are the easiest person to fool. And he was actually talking about Robert Millikan in this case, um, which is interesting context that most people don't get to tie up. So we have one person that did weird things with outliers. We have someone else that knew the direction they were supposed to be going in. How do we begin to make this less of a problem or at least more reproducible so other people can confirm or deny the, the conclusions that we've come to? So, Having inconsistent or unreproducible results is exceptionally uncommon. So this is a graph of foods that either cause cancer or do not cause cancer. It turns out, and so if things are to the right, it causes, like the dots to the right are foods that cause cancer, or dots to the left do not cause cancer, or pre prevents against cancer. So it's seeing this, and seeing multiple studies coming to very different conclusions, it's really hard to feel comfortable with observational studies at all. But the reason that we're able to make this sort of graph is that the people that did these studies wrote down what their protocol was, wrote down their methods, and other people were then able to come and try these again. So this ends up being very important. And seeing meta-studies in general on observational methods should make you uncomfortable. But I want to skip to meta-studies on experimental physics because I think this is probably my favorite plot ever. So, similar to Newton, there have been many, many meta-studies in experimental physics, particularly in particle physics, where a group at a time is trying to measure something. So here, they're trying to, to measure eta, which is a sort of measure of uh, like non-symmetry in some fundamental force, and the, the x-axis here is time, and the y-axis is the measurement of eta. And so you can see that for a while, people are just sort of slowly decreasing the error bars around what they think is the correct result. And then suddenly, 
a much better method of trying to measure eta comes around. And the, the mean and what everyone is trying to measure around suddenly changes. So we see that this, we see that bandwagon bias is not just one person trying to make their theory match experimental results, it's many people's experimental results. And so techniques from particle physics can also, you can also try to apply. Um, eventually there becomes a limit to how much you're going to be able to do. But things that experimental particle physicists do now is blind themselves to the data a little bit by adding in random noise so they can't quite tell where, uh, where their results are ending up and then have a way to remove that noise at the end. So back to reproducibility. So the ways that you actually make your uh, method reproducible is again, file your protocol, document we're gonna do really early, version control your analysis in your model. And so this is actually quite a bit more than just version controlling your code in Git. Um, when I run a model, there's data that I run against and there's new data coming in every day. So I usually also record what, um, like the queries that were actually run along with a filter for dates where up, use all data up until this date so that if I were to go back and rerun it, I wouldn't suddenly be using new data to fit model parameters. And document the source of your data so others can find it. And document the results and how you came to those conclusions as well as some of the sort of paths you went down um, in analysis. So you can have reproducible studies, other people can do the same thing that you did, or at least have a good enough understanding of what they would change in the future. So then when you're presenting results, often people in statistics result p-values, which it's like, oh, you know, if your p is less than zero, like 0 0.05, then your model is correct, which is a very uh, incorrect interpretation. And so I tend to, res to report results or effect sizes. So here we can see one is comparable to 5.0. Anything less than one is better. Anything greater than one is worse. And so we can see that over time, both the uh, confidence intervals for my effect sizes are getting smaller, and that the effects themselves are less than one, and our software is improving, which is like the punchline software is improving. Yay. <laughs> So the meta plan of doing good studies is to phrase a specific question, make a plan, circulate that plan, stick to the plan. If things don't work out, keep sticking to the plan. <laughs> Have a few other plans that you might try later. And then let other people stick to your plan. So if you're interested in doing statistics a little bit better, interested in sort of the traps that you can fall into, a really, really approachable book that I really enjoy is called Statistics Done Wrong, A Woefully Complete Guide. Uh, and in there is a quote that I think is just amazing and accurately reflects what I think about statistics, which is the awkward middle ground between fact and opinion. You have data that you're trying to come to very opinionated conclusions about, and you need to be clear about those opinions and how you're coming to those conclusions. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Wonderful. Um, are there any questions? So one of the things I was expecting to mention you didn't was that if you're trying to uh, study software quality of releases, you don't really have an awful lot of releases. I mean, if you make a release every six months or whatever, or even if you make a release every few weeks, there aren't enough numbers for the statistics to look, to be necessarily very convincing, and often there's special things about them. How do you deal with that if you're trying to understand your software quality? So the amount of data that's needed to get good results, so good in this case would be smaller confidence intervals, um, actually has to do with the number of events that we see, not the number of releases that we have. Because the way that releases fit into my model is that release numbers are basically what we're splitting on and what we're comparing. And so having just a few actually makes that a little easier because all of our customers are split just between a few of them. Um, in this, we can see that some of our confidence intervals are very, very large. So the ones that, are, that look like the effect sizes at zero and the confidence intervals are going to infinity. Those, this graph was generated probably the week that those came out. So we have minor versions and then our maintenance versions. And so the maintenance versions are on the far 
right of the Meyer version plots, except for this one because it got sorted out a little weird. Um, and if people are not on that release and we're not getting many events coming in, then we just don't have good results for it. And so the way that I try to deal with that is, again, reporting effect size and also population size. Um, in this case, because we're looking at the number of clusters, or like the number of units over time, I report how many cluster days, so like days of clusters running this particular version we have for these results. Uh, I see one down there in the front. Hello, thanks for the very interesting speech. Um, I was wondering, have you tried something like a time series? Uh, because um, I'm a developer and always when one uh, bug pops up, you finish it and you don't know where, uh, when you're at the top of the hill, so probably another bug comes around. Uh, I think time series would be uh, great to, uh, to try uh, on this. Yeah, so in a sense, this model is sort of covering the concept of time series. So you can imagine, yeah, like one of these. So this, this plot on the right, or these time to failure plots, you can imagine that the way that we're modeling a cluster is that we have a cluster at t equals zero. And that cluster at t equals zero is when they install that new version of CDH 5.3. And so the, we can make a function for them, which is the cumulative number of support cases they've had at time t. So if they have their first support case one day later, then at t equals one, that function suddenly jumps to one. And if they have their next one five days later, at t equals six, that, assumption, that function suddenly jumps to two. And so in a sense, it captures time series, but when you have a bunch of events happening over time, the way that you translate that into a function of time, it can actually change quite a lot. Because if, if your initial version is like these discrete events at points in time, but you can imagine also averaging them over time to get a like rate in the last month. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can translate events, event time series into to functional time series. So functions over time. And just another small, another small question. I was wondering uh, with the cancer problem, I saw the x-axis. Uh, it goes from 0.0 to 0.02, and on the, on, the other, on the right side, it goes from 1 to 3. Is it logarithmic? Uh, no, it's uh, the cancer, uh, the cancer uh, from tea and uh, coffee and uh, uh, tomatoes, what causes cancer, oh, the, the, stu right. the studies. You see the x, -ax x axis? Mm. Mm. Yeah, so it looks like they, <laughs> yeah, it looks like they have that on a logarithmic scale. Yeah, it's not really comparable this way, I think. <laughs> well, so it, it looks uh, it looks as so I think you're never going to get a negative effect yeah, yeah. when you're looking at the the values that they're reporting here. Yes. And so I think to get symmetrical results, this is this is the way to report it, right? Because if you were to do it, because it's centered, so it's not centered around zero, or like yes. plus one is comparable to minus one. Okay. It's centered around one, where zero is the same as infinity. Alright. Okay. Thanks a lot. Welcome. Thank you for your question. We've got time for one more. Yes. Should I throw it? I feel like we can do this. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Um, in your example, your software quality was improving. Um, how do you do the kind of analysis beyond that of why it's improving, or you know what you would do differently if it was getting worse? How do you start disentangling that? Yeah. So that is what I'm working on currently. Uh, what we have is post-release quality. We make our software, we give it to customers, and we get our responses in a very real way. So this is like the integration test of quality, right? Um, or at least the, integra <laughs> uh, the integration real world test. And we would like to understand what makes quality, like what drives quality, and what is making our software better or worse, and ways we can improve that. And so having a quantitative measure post-release is going to help us do that. What I'm currently doing is honestly very basic things in focusing on components and giving information back to components about what is working well and what their support cases, what support cases or JIRA tickets or conversations on um, mailing lists are around so that they can see what is, is giving us the most issues. So I have these, I have component-wide component-wise reports for each team that's working on a particular function. Uh, and 
Yeah, that's mostly what I'm doing right now, is trying to give people specific information. But once a future direction and thing that, thing that I will be doing is trying to link information about pre-release metrics to post-release quality measures. And so particularly like working with open source projects, uh, it's, we have a, some amount of control, but not total control, over what's happening and what's going on in these projects and how much they're changing. So I work with Spark quite a lot, for example. Are, are any of you, are most of you familiar with Spark? It's like a distributed data processing framework. And the thing about Spark is that it changes really quickly and there's a lot of changes happening in the code. The Spark community likes to say, it's like, oh, we're one of the most active Apache projects. It's like, well, it's because they're one of the newest and a lot of people are using it. And so they need to make a lot of changes to change the API and fix bugs. And so the number of patches going in between releases, I think, is going to be a particularly interesting thing to analyze. Um, since I have this target metric now that I think is actually pretty good for understanding what the quality of a release is, I'm going to do an analysis to see what the effect of, for example, number of patches in an upstream, meaning like an open source project that we then repackage and add more of our patches to. Um, things like that. So I, my, I will probably start there with a relatively simple uh, linear regression sort of analysis to see what effects different variables like number of patches upstream have on downstream quality measures. Okay, um, that's all we have time for. Can we get another round of applause for Juliet, please?